Some years ago, we originally wanted to save the vestiges of the old existing jazz places, and there were two spots, the halfway house, which we lost, it's since been torn down, it was at the corner of the I-10 and, and Battery Road there, and the other one was the 400 block of Rampart Street, where there are still four buildings uh, that date back to the turn of the previous century. And so I said, why don't we do, why don't we fulfill this lifelong ambition? Bob Ice and I wrote this show. Oh, God. Edmond Souchon, the venerable doctor, who was also a great jazz enthusiast, was alive. I mean, this is 50 years ago. We did this for a convention, and uh, Edmond helped us put all the correct gra uh, details in the history. Uh, just looking for a place to park. To, to, to immortalize. And so I said, well, how about we do a documentary? We feel that not enough respect has been paid to the music that New Orleans gave to the world. Not enough respect has given to the, the to this incubator here that we had in New Orleans, where jazz was born here, this wonderful port city, the mixture of all the races and ethnic groups that was one reason that jazz was founded in New Orleans. Eighth century Spain, the Moorish invasion, the Mohammedan conquest where African and European cultures forged an unlikely yet harmonious alliance. These Berber tribesmen set in motion what started out as fringe behaviors and eventually set the stage for an innovative but tortured art form. And so dreamily portrayed in the hauntingly tragic St. James Infirmary Blues. Tonight we would like to take you on a journey through the dark and mystical enigma known as jazz. Please join us now on a journey, one which is far older and darker, the roots of which run far deeper than ever imagined. Originally ass music, yes, ass music as street slang until the conforming J was added. Then S's were then replaced with Z's to thwart the mischievous efforts of vandals. 
When we look at the branches of jazz from the beginning of the last century, we only scratch the surface of its origins. But without the roots, little exists of the true American art form. Not bebop, not rock, not even rap and hip hop. The misty web surrounding its development must be untangled. But in order to find a more solid foundation, let's come forward several centuries. It's now 1803. The Louisiana Territory was sold to the United States in ceremonies at the Cabildo on Jackson Square. Then in 1815, Louisiana's recently named first governor, William C.C. Claiborne, in an attempt to weaken the grip of a mysterious Afro-Caribbean religion, had given the Negro slaves a plot of ground, a sort of safety valve where they were temporarily relieved of their toil and released their emotions and poured out the frustrations of their captivity. Each Sunday afternoon, the sights of the African and Caribbean dancers was mesmerizing. They swayed and leaped and strutted to a hundred variations of ancient tribal rites. They chanted, Danse Bumbula, Bodum, Bodum as they struck their native drums with an animal jawbone and whispered incantations to the high priestess, Marilavo, the voodoo queen. There was a conjo lady not long ago did originally was the band, the narration, and the slides. In those days, we went in a rear projection. Uh, it, was, it was beautifully done. They had big four-inch slant and slides. It was relevant. And we did this for this convention. And so then we did it several, many other times. We did it at Tulane. We did it in hotels. We did it for other conventions. And then it lay kind of fallow. And I said, hey, we got this thing. Why don't we use this? as a vehicle to at least create this lasting memory. And so we did. And so the stage is set, New Orleans around 1850, where the culminating element of our passage begins. On the poor back end of the French Quarter, steps from the iconic streetcar once at Congo Square. It was subsequently renamed Beauregard Square and is now part of Armstrong Park. Behind it rests the Municipal Auditorium and the Mahalia Jackson Performing Arts Theater. Here, where over 200 years ago, bare black feet danced in the dust to the throb of spasm bands, a stark contrast to its current state, housing symphony, opera, and ballet. Just a few steps from here was the original New Orleans Jazz Museum, circa 1960 at 833 Conti Street. 
where our musical heritage spawned in that barren field of Congo Square was first enshrined. The museum's interior, the man on the left is Harry Sujaw, a founding member of the New Orleans Jazz Club and one of the original patrons of The Last Straws. Now the museum is located in the old United States Mint, where we sit here today. But let's go back now to the old square where the last straws musically trace the history of New Orleans jazz. Featuring the tunes composed and made famous and sometimes dissipated jazz culture. It's only fitting that we start the journey with the theme song of the New Orleans Jazz Club, a song entitled Congo Square. With our first few tunes, we would like to touch upon a most significant period in the foundation of jazz, the time between the Civil War and the turn of the century. During that period, two milestones occurred. First was the Cotton Centennial Exposition, the World's Fair of 1884. The then world-famous Mexican national band was a rousing success, playing their famous Over the Waves and other music, it continuously to sold out crowds along Exposition Boulevard. They left behind many of their Latin musical influences as well as their instruments. Cashing out for good money, they sold their tools locally and prayed that the government would ante up the necessary pesos to replace them when they got home. You can see many of the Exposition's buildings rising beyond the Mississippi River in the foreground where the band played is now the site of the most beautiful New Orleans homes, overlooking what was now Ottoman Park, then the Centennial Lagoon. The second milestone, at the close of the Civil War, New Orleans was one of the quartermaster mustering out centers, and as a result, surplus musical instruments began to appear in the pawn shop windows of the city. Quite naturally, these instruments, as well as those left by the Mexicans, found their way to the Sunday afternoon rituals in Congo Square. And as these self-taught music men find their places, their music, drawn from centuries of history, begins to take shape. Martial and military music added significantly to the rhythm and intonation of jazz. But the war between the states lent material elements. The beginning of freedom for men to express themselves musically, and the instruments to do so, unmatched elsewhere in the story of this music. The year, 1863. It is ironic that one of the most tragic eras of the history of our country provides the bridge by which jazz is transported from its varied archaic beginnings to the music we know today. of different genres that led to the history of jazz. There were religious songs, slow drags, fast jubilees, cakewalk, the buck and the wing, ragtime, country brass bands, the jig and the reed, black minstrels, white minstrels, 
work songs on the river, on the rails, on the levee, and the blues. All are being fitted into the archway of jazz, and slowly, but unalterably, the late 19th century musicians are shaping the keystone. The white and black spirituals of the time suggest the next title, Georgia Camp Meeting. From the campgrounds to the streets, shortly before the turn of the century, marching bands in New Orleans were everywhere, and carnival parades provided a perfect match. This shot of the Reliance Brass Band is from a French newsreel and is the first known film ever made of a Mardi Gras street parade. The year was 1914. The marching bands further provided what was to become part of the ritual fiber of New Orleans. 100 years ago, almost everyone belonged to some secret society, benevolent association, or fraternal order. When a member died, he was privileged to have a band escort him on his way to paradise. Thus, the marching bands in New Orleans adopted a European tradition that is part of the warp and sinew of New Orleans to this very day. With a slow, pausing tread, the procession is marching there to the whitewashed cemetery accompanied by soft, somber dirges. But quiet now. The second line is forming, y'all. Step back. It's time to go. They're walking with the king. But once the body was interred, the cornet would sound the call. The drummer would throw on his snare. And in tribute, the band would cut out with happy jazz to enliven their friend's final journey. And so the keystone has now been dropped into place, and the true jazz is about to emerge. New Orleans has become a national and international sensation. Congo Square has taken on a new appearance. Even the young adapt to the new look as seen in this 1899 photograph of the famous young Emile Stalebred Lacombe's Razzy Dazzy Spasm Band. Those instruments played archaic jazz at its very best but the instruments in the older bands were improving rapidly as this 1910 shot of the Superior Orchestra shows. The cornet player here was Bunk Johnson. Enter gentleman Papa Jack Lane, the man credited with organizing and managing a great many of the first white marching bands here in New Orleans, long before the turn of the century. He often commanded as many as eight bands on Mardi Gras from sun up through Comus night. Here, the New Orleans Jazz Club and the Last Straws Band honored him on his 90th birthday in 1963 with a testimonial French Quarter Parade and a Last Straws concert. But to find New Orleans' earliest sit-down jazz band, we must look to an area that produced street names like Marais, that's French for swamp, and thus it became the name for the entire area. John Chase once said that its name, the swamp, was the only honest thing about the place. 
It was frequented by the notorious Cane Tox, the Creole name for all barge hands from the Ohio, Mississippi River Valley. But even their bravado of being half man, half alligator sometimes got them rolled and bounced from the even tougher brothels. Today, ironically, government buildings sit on that very spot. But if you were to trace back along the old Perdido Street, Spanish for lost, your map leads to the quaint funky butt hall. Uh, no, that's not the funky butt, but rather the home of our first cornet king. The ill-fated but oh-so-talented Buddy Bolden. He played at Funky Butt and could often be heard singing about some lady of the evening who's got that Elgin movement with the 10-year guarantee. Everybody loves my baby. Cornet Kings. One of the early great local favorites was Papa Celestin, who began playing professionally in 1896 at the age of 12 as Sonny Celestin. The popularity he enjoyed in the teens and 20s was just a small measure of the success this jazz giant enjoyed later in his years. Although he died way too soon, December of 1954, his band was prominent in the Dixieland Jazz Revival following World War II. Competition in the early days was keen. Thus, one story about another king explains that he often covered his valve hand with his handkerchief to conceal his fingering technique. No, it was not Armstrong, as commonly thought, but the early jazz legend, Freddie Kippard, of the original Creole Orchestra. Another of those who made jazz history was this frail giant, Willie Bunk Johnson. Bunk played his first gig in 1894 and, like Papa Celestin, played in the post-World War II rebirth. Bunk left us many wonderful, great tunes and memories, like Spicy Advice and Tin Roof Blues. Well. Bunk was rediscovered working in the sugarcane fields in New Iberia, Louisiana, and is heavily credited with the Dixieland resurgence. And how he played all the jazz heroes, including clarinetist George Lewis and Lawrence Marrero, banjo instructor. So let's remember Bunk with one of his favorites, Careless Love.
Thank you, Courtney. Here is a picture of Bunk as historian Bill Russell found him in the 40s. And with the immortal Sidney Bechet, a large number of other musicians participated in the post-World War II revival. Each contributed in their own way, and some with rather unique instruments. This is Bugle and Sam Decamel, who in the early days attracted customers to his family's waffle wagon, playing an old army bugle. No vowels, but all the right notes. And how about a bazooka? This fellow was Noon Johnson. He occasionally appeared with a young tuxedo band in parades, but the college kids loved hearing him play his homemade bazooka with his skiffle trio and seeing one of their favorite ditties, Time Marches On. Or maybe you want bells. This lady is the much recorded Sweet Emma the Bell Gal Barrett. She couldn't read a note but played from 1923 with all the city's top reading bands. Her moniker was born at a New Orleans Jazz Club concert when a member provided her a set of bell garters with which she kept time with her rhythmic legs. Here's further proof of creative instrumentation. A two-string homemade plywood bass fiddle and not so creative drums rescued from the Eagle Pawn Shop on South Rampart Street. But let's go back to the fellow who adopted the handkerchief as his signature. Louis Armstrong was born into turn of the century poverty in a row house on Jane Alley at Perdido Street. Here's the rear of his childhood home. Now why, people ask, was or is Louis Armstrong the quintessential jazz man? Well, among other things, he spanned seven popular decades of music from traditional to swing and beyond, but mainly it was his uncommon talents that did it. His fingering was but one of three great assets he possessed, and possessed them he did from an early age at the orphanage where he was raised. He, like Buglin Sam, played an old tin horn at age five to attract customers to the furniture wagon owned by his patrons, the Karnofskys. They operated a furniture store right down from the Eagle Saloon on South Rampart Street, where he later played his first commercial gig. It was there that Louis first excitedly fired a pistol into the 1913 New Year's Eve air that earned him an arrest. But it also earned him an opportune confinement, thanks again to the Karnofskys, to the New Orleans Waifs home. Their devotion to Louis was cause for his joining the home's band with their first gift of his cornet, undoubtedly the seed for an unparalleled career. It all began here with musical training under his first teacher, and the Holmes bandmaster, Peter Davis. Louis's second asset was his lip, for what he accounts the nickname Satchmo, or short for Satchel Mouth. This type of nickname was often hung on the hornmen like Louis, referring to their amazing lip size and power. Incidentally, you're looking at a picture of his first bugle and cornet, both treasures of the New Orleans Jazz Museum. At other times, he was called Gatemouth. The Ori Dodds Band and the New Orleans Boot Blacks used to play a tune by his third moniker, Dipper Mouth. Of course, Louis' third asset was his singing, that wonderful gravelly voice, and of course, scat. The most popular story of its origin tells of some recording vocalists dropping the sheet music, thus having to ad-lib the words. 
Singers have been mimicking that sound ever since. And now comes Bobby McIntyre continuing that tradition with Louis' plaintive cry of a black man in his day, the soulful wail of what did I do to be so black and blue? Bobby, what did you do? Full empty bed, springs hard as lead. Oh, pains in my head, feel like on dead years. What did I do? Job for me, no company. Even the mouse ran from the house. Oh, what did I do? To be so black and blue Baba Daza, oh yeah Mr. Lewis Armstrong right here, thank you gang God bless you, hey That's Pops, forever the king, as he ruled over the New Orleans Zulu Parade in Mardi Gras of 1949. This is the world-famous Basin Street of musical lore. But I want you to close your eyes now and imagine it's 1917. Come now, lean in a little closer to the fire, for it's a bitter, cold night here on Basin Street in November of that year. And Storyville, I know you've heard of Storyville, the old red light district, a legend even in its own heyday, is passing into the history books. The Army and Navy have set up bases in New Orleans just prior to World War I, and the military camps shut down the lid on the place where jazz had finally begun to pay its way. Of the many elaborate sporting houses down the line, Mahogany Hall was one of the most renowned and highest class, should you choose to call it such in a, for a place like that. <laughs> This social register, or blue book of Storyville, it reflects the height of its glory. This unabridged directory was actually in use until the day the fabled area was closed. However, today is a sad day for the musicians in both the fancy houses and cheap cribs, while they load the wagons and shoulder the mattresses for the girls as they walk out of Storyville forever. But a priceless heritage is left to New Orleans and the jazz in the person of one Ferdinand Lamoth Jelly Roll Morton. Storyville was his playground. That's Jelly Lord, as he modestly called himself, playing in the lavish surroundings of Hilma Burt's Mirror Ballroom. It was here that he used to play a tune he appropriated from the fabulous Tony Jackson. Jelly Roll had it copyrighted and used it as his own theme. Of course, it's the notorious whining boy blues.
As you heard a phrase from that jazz evergreen is mama, mama, take a look at sis. She's out on the levee and she's doing the twists long before Chubby Checker made it famous in the 50s. With the closing of Storyville, jazz experienced but a brief setback. With the advent of recording and the roaring 20s, jazz suddenly became the new upbeat spirit of this jubilant age. On the lakefront in New Orleans, people were boarding excursion boats like the Camellia, and they danced and sang and cruised around Lake Pontchartrain, listening to melodies written as testimonials to the fun times in Milneyburg. Camps lined the shores. Now, it's not the same now as when Smokey Mary chugged from downtown out Elysian Fields to this pleasure spot, but the tune is still as rousing, and it's called Milneyburg Joys. Thank you, Courtney. Our own New Orleans Owls played this one back in the 20s. Sailing on Lake Pontchartrain and a 23 skadoo to you. At last, with the sounds of Milneyburg fading in our ears, we must sadly close yet another chapter on jazz in New Orleans. For many of the early jazz bands had long since taken to the river, playing aboard plush river excursion steamers. In this manner, jazz worked her way north that's the celebrated Fate Marble Band. And many musicians found they liked the reception they were given in Kansas City, Memphis, St. Louis, and Chicago. So as we close this fable era, let's open a brand new one. Let's board the Delta Queen and head for the Windy City. Come on out, Courtney. Welcome to Chicago. Jazz, nursed and weaned in the streets and squares of New Orleans, began to earn its way in Storyville. Now it strove in Chicago for the thing it now lacked, respectability. We say that advisedly for the little fat cat in the blue suit leaning on Tom Brown's trombone case as he arrives in Chicago is said to be none other than Alphonse Capone. Respectability? Uh, no. All they did was put new clothes on her and sat her down to be heard in fancy places. Whereas New Orleans musicians had to play in the likes of Frank Early's Saloon, Mama Lou's, and Artesian Hall, where the musicians had to sit up in that loft behind chicken wire to protect them from rowdy patrons and flying bottles, of course, at the Saturday night fish fry. Here in Chicago, at the Haymarket Cabaret, the original Dixieland Jazz Band perfected their music before going to New York, and eventually their first ever recording. Two historically significant old jazz sites are here in New Orleans. First is the Halfway House, so-called because it was located halfway between downtown and the lakefront. This eminently popular jazz club was an early home to a plethora of famous jazz names, George McCullum. Armand Piron, Peter Bocage, and Lorenzo Tio, but his most well-known tenant was the most famous recording band of the 20s, the Halfway Orchestra featuring the Brunies Charlie Cordilla and Leon Rapolo. The second most historical site is four vitally important turn-of-the-century buildings still standing on South Rampart Street. These monuments are still standing. The Eagle Saloon and the Karnofskys, the Iroquois Theater, and the Little Jim Saloon. Do you remember Armstrong's birthplace in Jane Alley? 
Uh, not quite mm, old enough. <laughs> neither am I. <laughs> well, there it sat until 1963 when the city decided it needed a new criminal court and jail complex. The oft-told sad story is that some jazz club stalwarts had scraped together enough money to save the house from the wrecking ball and move it to a new place to be preserved. But they arrived with a check at City Hall three hours too late. What a shame, huh? Drats. But back now to Chicago. Instead of our joints, they now appeared at the fancy Lincoln Gardens, Lamb's Cafe, and even the plush Royal Gardens. These dudes are none other than our own old New Orleans Rhythm Kings, dressed out in tuxedos and rechristened as the Friars Society Orchestra. But you can be sure they rose to the occasion when they played the Royal Garden Blues. How about that band, huh? Because of the intense competition among early jazz bands, some, like the great A.J. Piron New Orleans Orchestra, refused to record and risk being copied. In fact, the powerful Freddie Keppard was offered a recording contract in 1916, but turned it down for that very reason. But Nick LaRocca and his original Dixieland jazz band took that chance and became the very first to be recorded. The year 1917. The first waxing was made in New York. As the Roaring Twenties arrived, they became the symbol of jazz. And you can imagine how the old Victrola would swing out as they gave out with composer LaRocca's signature piece, the original Dixieland One Step. As we mentioned, was the early maker of jazz kings. One, King Oliver, was credited with discovering and nurturing the young Louis Armstrong and invited him to join him in Chicago. In the old days, Oliver played two gigs a year at the original Central Building, now basketball's Fogelman Arena, on Tulane's campus. Appropriately, our next tune was given to us along with so many others by this immortal, shown here with his Creole jazz band in Chicago. Our selection here is a song written by sideman, Louis Armstrong's then current wife, and accomplished pianist, Lil Hardin. Let's listen to Canal Street Blues.
As the story of early jazz draws to a close, it would be most incomplete without the addition of one final name, not only for his great talent, but also for the part he played in the transition from the traditional to the modern. His birthplace, Davenport, Iowa, will give you a clue to the changing times as well as name. Leon Bix Spiderback. This fanciful slide of Bix and Lewis aptly portrays this transition. Although he died in 1932 before age 30, Bix is still numbered among the greats. In tribute now, the last straws would like to play one of his favorites, Wolverine. As our trail has meandered down the diverse branches of jazz, we wish there were one tune we could play that would sum up what jazz means to all people. Unfortunately, there is no such melody, just as there is nothing anywhere in this world, one thing that means the same thing to everybody. But we conclude with the early favorite, when the saints go marching in. Courtney, take us home. We are trained. Fall. 